Well, good evening to all of those who might be joining and are willing to spend um, this next brief period of time with me to talk about the concerns they may or may not have about family building, fertility, infertility, whatever those questions might be, it's an honor and an incredible privilege to be with you tonight and to be directing some answers to questions you may have. Speaking of those questions, um, you can use um, the typical uh, icons that you see on your Zoom link, whether it's the chat room, whether it's the open questions, the q and I'm more than happy to answer those and look forward to doing so. While I wait for things to build up, let me give everyone a summer of a sense of who I am and what are some of the more common questions and concerns that I hear about every day. Well, number one, I'm David Riley and I'm a reproductive endocrinologist, which means a fertility and infertility specialist at Boston IVF. Uh, my office is in the downtown Boston area, and I am pleased to inform so many people that we are back, meaning the pandemic is kind of receding, Boston is getting busy, and our office later this month will be fully operational for monitoring, seeing patients, and all the things that make it so convenient um, for my patient population. It's great to be able to say that. So again, feel free to ask questions. Some of the things that I typically hear is, when should I see an infertility specialist or a fertility specialist? When should that happen? Well, first of all, if the question is entering your mind, that might be the time to see an infertility specialist, number one. Number two, if you are a couple that's been attempting to build their family and you're having difficulties and it's taking a long time, anywhere from six to 12 months, but that has led to nothing as of that time period, that's definitely a time to see a reproductive endocrinologist. If you are a member of a family or you're planning to build your family, and you're not in the typical kind of traditional heteronormative construct, that's obviously the time to see us because we can definitely assist you and respect you and enjoy helping you build your family. Those are kinds of the common questions I hear. Other questions include how much testing has to be done? How long does it take? How uncomfortable might it be? Well, the testing, believe it or not, when an individual or a couple presents is done relatively quickly with a short time period that's timed to a follow-up visit so that patient and their partner can have a discussion about what the testing means and where we can proceed and how we can proceed. So we can do that pretty quickly in a way that I find is very convenient for the individual or individuals who might be seeking our services. So that's some of the common questions I hear. It's important to bring up that March of 2022 is um, Endometriosis Awareness Month. Endometriosis is a condition that impacts individuals and it's associated with typically painful periods and unfortunately often infertility. The good news for those of you who have been diagnosed with endometriosis, who have yet to build a family or try to build a family, most individuals with endometriosis are fertile. That's good news. But unfortunately, women who are infertile or individuals who are infertile, they have a six to eight times greater incidence of having endometriosis. So if you know you have it or you're suspicious that you might have it, it would be important to see somebody like a reproductive endocrinologist to give you some sense of the implications of that diagnosis and how it may or may not impact your family building plans. So I'm gonna start reading some questions. Um, here's one, it is from Becky, um, 28 years old, parted with a 31 year old 
I assume male, and they have tried twice, meaning I assume two ovulation cycles and have been unsuccessful. The question is, should I keep trying or is it time to see a doctor? It's always time to see a doctor if there's some problems. Is there difficulties with intercourse, meaning pain, particularly pain that is impacting the event itself, the coital event, number one. If periods are really heavy, number two. If that partner is having any type of um, sexual dysfunction, that would be a reason to see a doctor and a reproductive endocrinologist. But if things look good, if the periods are regular, if you feel like the timing's okay and you're not having any problems, yeah, I think two tries is a little early. Youth is good. I am totally jealous that you're 28. Um, but I think if you go six to 12 months and at that point you're not successful or any of those issues present themselves that I just mentioned, that would be a good time to see someone. Um, here's a great question. Um, I have a question for Dr. Riley. What is the oldest age a woman can freeze her eggs? Great question. I think it's better um, phrased as what is the optimal time for a woman to freeze her eggs? The optimal time is under the age of 35. And that's based on the fact that the older one gets, particularly over the age of 35, you're freezing eggs that are less likely to result when they are thawed in the future so as to create embryos to confer a pregnancy to that individual, it's going to be harder and it's going to require more eggs to freeze. So typically for a woman over the age of 35, there's more cycles that are involved. There's more cycles so that you can have enough to have relative reassurance that you've been able to preserve your fertility successfully. So we can do it over age 35. We often do it over age 35 and it works well. Once you get over age 40, it's not that it's too old to freeze eggs, but there's a greater chance that the testing will suggest you won't respond to the treatment. But if the testing says you would respond, it would require multiple cycles to have a reasonable chance of success. So optimal under age 35, really tough to do when you're over age 40 and somewhere between 38 and 40 is somewhat of a less optimal time, but still certainly can be done. So here's a question. Um, I am trying to get pregnant for three years after my miscarriages. I'm so sorry because um, miscarriages, I don't think there's a great form for individuals who miscarry, especially those who have a recurrent miscarriages. There's no great form for them to talk to someone and for someone to take the time to explain to them and for someone to let them know it's not their fault. I think women um, and individuals who have miscarriages are so incredibly hard on themselves. They feel like it's something they did or didn't do. That's never the case. It's almost impossible to cause a miscarriage. So I wanna give this individual that shout out that number one, I am incredibly sorry, but number two, please feel like you've had no control because you haven't had control. So the question is, after my miscarriages, I do all the exams and the doctor says everything is fine. So miscarriages can often be unexplained, but 95 plus percent of miscarriages, 95 plus percent are due to genetic abnormalities within the conception, within the pregnancy that's taken hold. So the miscarriage is nature's way of preventing an abnormal pregnancy from continuing. But you wanna do an appropriate evaluation to rule out all the potential causes. Things like anatomic issues within the pelvis that can be fixed often in a way that is minimally invasive. Making sure there's no metabolic or inherent disease disorders predisposing you towards a miscarriage making sure that there's no autoimmune issues that are predisposing one towards a miscarriage, making sure that your genetics 
in your partner's genetics or the sperm you're using in the case of donor insemination, those genetics are normal, meaning there's no predisposition towards having more miscarriages. And in the end, if all that testing is normal, there's a really good chance you will have a successful conception. But part of treating recurrent miscarriages is getting a sense of control, not getting just the pat on the back that says, yeah, go off and try, it should be fine. Even though that might be the case, as one gets older and as one with their partners trying to build their family, they're gonna wanna be able to have some control to increase the odds and to build their family. And often that requires creating embryos in the, in the setting of IVF, especially for older individuals where you can genetically test them to mitigate that miscarriage risk. Uh, next question is a tough one. Um, and I love the challenge. Um, what's the success rate of IVF with adenomyosis? Adenomyosis, for those who might not know, is a condition often associated with heavy periods, and it's endometriosis of the uterus. So endometriosis is when uterine lining tissue is inside the pelvis. Adenomyosis is when uterine lining tissue invades the wall of the uterus. And like I said about endometriosis earlier, most women with adenomyosis are fertile. But unfortunately, we find that women who are infertile have higher rates of adenomyosis. Most women will succeed with reproductive technologies who have the adenomyosis. But if in the course of their treatment, they are found to have failed embryo transfers, recurrent pregnancy loss, or just failed implantations, sometimes there's some data suggest that you could go on therapies that improve the ability of the uterine lining receptivity that might be impacted by the adenomyosis. So the answer to the question is yes, people with adenomyosis can get pregnant, often do on their own, and we have strategies we can use with artificial reproductive technologies to overcome whatever impact it might be playing. So I'm going to the other side of my computer and the question is, after one and a half years of trying naturally to conceive and being unsuccessful, we are considering intrauterine insemination or in vitro fertilization. All fertility and blood tests are normal. Semen is normal. What is the first course of treatment that's recommended? Well, so much of that is predicated on your age. The good news is you have a diagnosis since all the tests are normal of what 25% of couples who present have unexplained infertility. Meaning, it doesn't mean you can't get pregnant because obviously everything looks good. It means you're not getting pregnant. And I always want to make sure people know that. So our technologies or our medical treatments are meant to ex expedite something safely that's taking too long. So if it's unexplained, yeah, you can get pregnant, but you want to build your family. Again, you want a level of control. So there's two approaches. One is medicated intrauterine insemination. One is IVF. Either one is appropriate. Medicated insemination is where you take a fertility drug, typically a pill called Clomid or Letrozole, and you combine it with an intrauterine insemination. That's where after ovulation, you come in and the partner with the semen, their sperm is concentrated in a syringe and flushed to the cervix and into the uterus. And the natural act of intercourse 100 to 300 sperm make it into the tubes to fertilize an egg. With intrauterine insemination, it's one to three million. So what you're doing is upping the ante. You're taking the fertility drug, you're combining it with the insemination, you're increasing the odds. You're treating everything because this is unexplained. It's easy, but not as successful as IVF. And after you've done two or three of those cycles, success rates are known to decline and it's recommended to move on to IVF or you could just start with IVF. IVF is more intense, more 
complicated than medicated insemination, but has a higher success rate. And at the same time that you're being treated with IVF, you're also preserving your future fertility. So you've taken control. You're safely expediting your ability to build your family and have reassurance for the future. Does IVF have a good chance of success with a large barricocele, parentheses, five millimeters, close parentheses, no fertility issues in the female partner and she is 31. So for the uninitiated, a varicocele is a dilated vein on the scrotum, which is known to impact semen or sperm parameters and therefore causing infertility for this couple. The repair of the varicocele, the expert on its repair would be a urologist, not a gynecologist. However, five millimeters typically is of the size that it's worthwhile repairing because semen parameters may, and I say may, may improve so that natural fertility and therefore natural conception could be restored. So typically what happens, the varicocele is repaired while we're waiting to see if the semen parameters are restored, and that typically takes six months to see that, while that couple is having natural attempts at conception, and while those semen parameters are improving, you could still do IVF or artificial reproductive technologies like insemination. So the question is, does IVF have a good success? Yes, because all we need is to get the eggs out to get the sperm in, but while you're waiting to see the efficacy of the varicocele repair, you can still do the IVF and you can still use the sperm from the ejaculated specimen. And who knows, six months down the road, the varicocele repair may have restored that individual's fertility. So yeah, you can definitely do IVF um, with a varicocele. Our next question, I will be 33 this year and my husband's 35. I haven't been on birth control pill or birth control rather in the eight years we have been together. I had normal periods until June of 21 and now have had month long or longer periods. I've had a leak procedure for the uninitiated. That's a surgical procedure. Well, a excisional procedure on the cervix to treat abnormal pap smears and scheduled to have a DNC tomorrow. Could these procedures affect our chances? These procedures are helping your chances. Number one, don't worry about the leap. So many women have leaps, no correlation with infertility. Do not worry about that. Also, with the amount of dysfunctional uterine bleeding you've been having, the DNC is helping. It's not hurting. You need the DNC to make sure that the uterine cavity is restored to normal from all the buildup of the bleeding from the dysfunctional breeding you've been having. You're making sure that the tissue that's removed at the DNC is evaluated. And a combination of that evaluation and some blood tests will determine why you're having the dysfunctional bleeding so your cycles can be restored. But clearly, unequivocally, the DNC is helping your fertility, not hurting. And if you folks have been together for eight years, and you've had unprotected intercourse, and you've been trying to build your family, just from your history alone, even before you talk about the dysfunctional bleeding, would warrant um, seeing a reproductive endocrinologist. Hi, I'm 38 years old. I tried IVF for the last two years with three pregnancies resulting in miscarriage. Again, um, I'm very, very sorry. I have three more frozen embryos at a particular institution, which I am planning to try. Should I try Boston IVF instead of that institution? I would never do, I would never, my God, I would never sell myself at the expense of an institution that is well-renowned, knows what they're doing, and are my colleagues. Is it good to get a second opinion from any one of these institutions, all of which work in the Harvard arena, and we therefore our colleagues, second opinions are great. Um, in fact, I don't think you should ever go to a doctor who doesn't want you to get a second opinion because that would be a red flag that that doctor doesn't feel confident with his or her diagnose, diagnostic acumen and treatments. But 
I would not worry at all about the institution you mentioned at all. They are my colleagues, they're great. And if you wanna get a second opinion to have your chart reviewed, that's a great idea. Not because I think you're going to the wrong place, but it's always good to get a second pair of eyes. How long can you wait to be pregnant after an HSG? So again, for the uninitiated, an HSG is a special diagnostic test that individuals who are having difficulties getting pregnant undergo. And it's basically, basically where dye is flushed into the uterus and into the fallopian tubes. When individuals come with infertility, and they have been having difficulty building their family, five to 10% of the individuals with a uterus will have abnormalities in that uterus. What are some of the abnormalities? Well, it could be a congenital abnormality. It could be an impact from previous surgery or a previous pregnancy. That would be a couple of examples. Or they could have blocked tubes. And blocked tubes, 25%, one out of four of individuals presenting with infertility Infertility will have blocked tubes. And the most common causes of blocked tubes is any inflammatory condition within the pelvis, which causes scarring, which blocks tubes. The most common of which is previous STD exposure, which often goes undiagnosed. Um, things like endometriosis that we've talked about with previous surgery. So this question is, how long can you get pregnant? You can get pregnant the very next month. You can get pregnant during the month that the HSG is done. So the HSG is timed prior to ovulation. So classically, for an individual who has 28-day cycles, it's going to be done pre-ovulatory from days 5 through 12. And therefore, you could get pregnant that month because you have yet to ovulate, and you can get pregnant the next month. So there's really no delay. You can tell I'm getting older because I have to look closely at the computer, so I apologize. How does family planning work if you have had a tubal ligation that can't be reversed? Um, it's in vitro fertilization. That's what it is. So just like the example I gave where the individual, um, their tubes were investigated and the tubes were blocked. Think of it the same way. That's called tubal factor infertility one of the causes of infertility. And so IVF is the process by which you're going to have eggs retrieved, fertilized with an individual sperm, embryos created, and then transferred through the cervix and into the uterus. So by doing, you bypassed the fallopian tubes that are blocked. That is how you get an individual pregnant whose tubes have previously been tied and that tubal reversal cannot be done. One of the unfortunate aspects of that type of IVF is insurance does not cover treatment of IVF for individuals who've had previous voluntary sterilization. I find that to be incredibly unfortunate because at the time one has a voluntary sterilization, they don't know what their future might be and they should not be quote, punish, close quote, for the past. But that is an unfortunate consequence of voluntary uh, sterilization. Once you have frozen embryos and you want to go for a cycle, that is that now considered a transfer cycle? Yes. And a transfer cycle, basically for those, again, the uninitiated when you do IVF, is your, when you're doing a frozen cycle, you're thawing that embryo. And it's thawed the day it's due to be transferred into the uterus. The transfer procedure for all intents and purposes, easy for me to say, is like a pap smear. A speculum is placed in the vagina. There's an ultrasound on the abdomen. And the embryo is placed in the uterus and the fluid that surrounds it, you can actually see it on the ultrasound, it's very, very cool. You get a pregnancy test 10 days later, and there's two ways to do that embryo thaw cycle. 
for those individuals who menstruate or ovulate regularly, you can just time the transfer with ovulation. So that's typically where you come into the doctor's office, an ultrasound and blood test eventually finds out the best day to um, target an ovulation by having you take a trigger shot. When you take that trigger shot, your body from where you ovulated is now producing all the necessary estrogen and progesterone to create a bed for the upcoming pregnancy. You take the trigger shot and seven days later, the embryo is thawed and transferred in the way I just described. Another way of doing it, which can be done for individuals who do have regular cycles, but definitely for individuals who don't have regular cycles for whatever reason that might be, including um, individuals who are menopausal, who no longer ovulate, but have embryos, for instance, from the past, from derived from their own eggs, or have they've had to use an egg donor. But that's where you go on estrogen to simulate a cycle, and a cycle where when an individual ovulates, that individual produces estrogen. So about two and a half weeks into the estrogen, if the uterine lining is receptive, you then start progesterone. The progesterone is typically administered as a shot. And on the fifth day of the progesterone, if you call the first day, day zero, you transfer the embryo. 10 days later, you get a pregnancy test. And whether you did the first approach I described, time with ovulation, or this approach that I just described, the success rate is the same. The second approach requires a continuation of taking those medications because the placenta hasn't formed yet to release those hormones that help support the pregnancy. But that is an embryo thaw cycle, and that's how it works, and those are the two different types. Can you see your regular OB, your obstetrician, if you have family planning done, or do you need a specialist? So if you're, there is no reason to see a specialist for family planning, except in those individuals who may not fit the heteronormative paradigm that describes what is typical or what certainly in my generation we typically grew up with. So for that heteronormative couple, yeah, you could see your OB and you could talk about family planning, healthy lifestyle, what to eat, timing of coitus, et cetera, et cetera. But for the individual or the couples who are not heteronormative, yes, you need to see us because what you're going to need is different sources of gametes and procedures done to assist you in building your family. Um, <laughs> to the individual who just thanked me for their two beautiful daughters, I'll send you a check, but you're welcome. Um, I always get embarrassed when I see those things, but um, that's awesome. Uh, it makes my day. Thank you for listening. Um, here's one. I am 44. I have never been pregnant. Having a partial hysterectomy in August due to many big fibroids rather than embolization. How would IVF work for me? How will I know if I have healthy embryos for surrogate implant? Um, at age 44, the option of creating embryos to use in a surrogate does not exist. Um, you're not, and this is me being your advocate, this is not me throwing in the towel, but the option of utilizing eggs that can be fertilized with sperm to create embryos that are going to successfully implant in a gest gestational carrier, the option doesn't exist. It does require an egg donor. And the reason being is that, believe it or not, and this is based on really good um, population-based data that's been enhanced by research, by the time an individual reaches the age of 44, nearly, if not all, of the eggs have abnormal DNA or chromosomes, and that's why it would require an egg donor, someone younger in their 20s, who produces eggs that yield embryos that have a high implantation potential. In terms of 
the partial hysterectomy and the fibroids sounds like um, the decision to use a surrogate is a good one, although albeit quite tough and unfortunately quite expensive. Um, is there anything specific to look, look for in a frozen egg donor? I know they are screened. Great question. Um, I always make the argument that what you know about an egg donor by the time you've chosen that individual, you know more about them than you knew about the partner that you may be building a family with. So you can't know everything about everybody and not everybody is perfect, but you're going to know their social history. You're gonna know their medical history. You're going to know if their eggs have been utilized for prior attempts at conception and intended parents have gotten pregnant or an intended individual has gotten successfully pregnant. So you're gonna know social background, you're gonna know genetic background, you're gonna know ethnicity, and you're gonna know what they look like, you're just not gonna know them. And believe me, that's why it works, because the testing and screening that is done is going to eliminate those individuals who should not be donors. Plus, the screening, the advantage of using an egg donor whose eggs are already frozen is you don't have to worry about the compliance of that individual undergoing IVF. It's been done. That individual was compliant. The eggs are there and she's been exhaustively screened. So you know a lot, you don't know everything. They're not perfect people, but you really can't know more than the screening they go through. And the beauty of using the bank is their, their compliance to taking the meds and doing it is all taken care of. I'm gonna to go to the other side of my computer. Can you explain the significance of sperm morphology what if it's 0% and the rest of the analysis is good or normal? Great question and a difficult one to answer. Okay, so for the uninitiated, what do we look at when we look at sperm? Well, we're looking at the volume of the ejaculate, which tells us about um, the anatomy and does this individual produce enough semen, number one. Number two, we look at the concentration of the sperm within that specimen, how many million per milliliter, and those are the units that we use. How well are the sperm swimming? Are they swimming well? Are they motile? Okay. And then there's morphology, a much more subjective assessment where you're looking at the shape of the heads and the shape of the tails. And this individual has said that um, that individual is concerned that none are shaped normally. Well, typically, when you see normal concentration, normal motility, and 0% normal shape, it's not that concerning because if you repeat the semen analysis, it's often back to normal. Normal would mean two to 4%, around 4% of the sperm are perfectly shaped. If on a repeat semen specimen, it's still 0%, it's still 1%, despite all those other normal parameters, the concern is if the infertility issue is otherwise unexplained, that morphology may be impacting the ability of sperm to get into the egg. But we don't really know, we don't have great data. But in that instance where it's persistent, the male will go through an exam with a urologist who specializes in fertility of the male, looking at hormones, looking at anatomy, looking at an exam, um, looking for varicoceles like we talked about earlier. And the treatment, of the persistent low morphology is IVF because you get the eggs in, excuse me, the eggs out to get the sperm in and to overcome what role that morphology might be playing, but definitely requires an evaluation with a urologist specializing in fertility. Wow. This is a wonderful question um, and I'm gonna read it, it's, it's great. Um, as a black woman and hopeful single parent, I feel there are challenges to arrive at a pregnancy. One is to conceive a child through a black donor 
are black sperm donors prevalent? My first and primary goal is to become a mom, but my preference is to raise a child that looks like me. Can you alleviate any concerns that I may have to select from a um, minute pool of donors? And lastly, what are my chances as a single woman, woman using donor sperm? Thank you. Great question, um, beautifully designed. Let me first address the issue about being a single mother by choice. 41%, I think the last time I read of pregnancies in the United States are unintended. I don't live in that world. I live in this world, the world of the incredibly intended. And children who are so intended, their parent or parents have devoted so much of their emotional, physical, and financial treasure to have them because they know that a family is defined not by two people, not people who identify themselves necessarily, not just by these people who necessarily identify themselves as a man or woman, by people who are going to provide love and allow that child to thrive. And a single woman who knows she's committed to this process and is gonna provide that love, then her child will thrive. I have so many patients who are single moms by choice. It's wonderful. In fact, Boston has the highest concentration that we know of of single mothers by choice because we're the land of the uber educated, the uber deferred childbearing. And I love these individuals and the families they build and the children they have. Now, obviously, as a Caucasian man, I can't even begin to be presumptuous enough to know um, what it must feel like as an African American woman trying to build her family. But what I can say from my personal experience working at Boston IVF, we work with a vast array, vast array of donor agencies that are FDA regulated and cater to individuals who are looking for certain ethnicities. And much like the population as a whole, the percent of individuals who are African-American and donating sperm is lower, for instance, than Caucasians. But my donor team can steer you to the right sperm banks. And we would endorse this, we would support you, and whatever challenges you may feel in society, you're not gonna feel a Boston IVF, number one, because we support single women by choice, and we can help you conceive that child. So I hope that, I hope that helps. Um, the best thing you can do is to call Boston IVF and see whichever doctor you would like to go to so we can help you do this. But it's incredibly rewarding and we can steer you in the right direction. I hope that, I hope that helps. And um, that was a great question. Um, I have a question from if an HSG, that's the anatomic survey, everybody of the uterus and tubes um, are dilated but open. What does that mean? Are there any impacts on ability to get pregnant? Great question. So if they're open and they're dilated, it might mean the HSG, HSG is not a perfectly sensitive test, that there could be some um, distortions within the pelvis, particularly scarring, that's causing those tubes to be dilated. Typically, when they're mildly dilated and there's flow going through the tube as determined by the HSG, things are okay. If the dilation is really prominent and the dye coming through the tubes is quite slow and difficult to develop, especially if it's bilateral, meaning both sides, it may warrant a day surgical procedure, otherwise known as a laparoscopy, to see if any scarring that's causing that dilatation needs to be resolved to enhance fertility. So in other words, if it's mild, the tubes are open, the dye is going through well, likely things are okay, because who wants to go through surgery if they don't need to? 
But if it's really prominent and it's a really delayed spill of dye, then that might warrant a day surgical evaluation through a procedure called a laparoscopy. Um, this patient says, my name is, and I'm not gonna give the name, and my wife are going through our first IVF cycle. Our doctor recommends that we should only do one embryo transfer. However, my sister in North Carolina was told by her doctor strictly to have two embryo transfers at the same time. Her first cycle failed due to one transfer, only, two, only but with two, she had a successful one. Do you think two embryo transfer is significantly better than one? Okay. This, so much of it is you can't compare yourself with your sister. It's age dependent. And the younger the individual who produced the eggs is, the higher the capacity of the embryo created from those eggs is to implant. So for instance, if the sister were older, particularly over 38, yeah, it would be pretty routine to transfer two to increase the odds of conception. But by so doing, you are increasing the risk of twins and we don't want patients to have twin pregnancies. People get excited when they have twins, but they have to recognize that twin pregnancies are high risk. And we're always concerned about the preterm birth that might be the consequence of a twin pregnancy. And the consequence of a preterm birth can be lifelong, such as cerebral palsy. So for an older individual, often, you have to increase the odds by transferring more than one, and we're praying it doesn't result in a twin pregnancy. Transferring one, especially in a younger individual, is the way to go, because what you're gonna do with the IVF is you're gonna transfer one, and for individuals who have a normal ovarian reserve assessment, and they're in a younger cohort, there's a really good chance, hovering in the 50 to 60% range, that that one embryo is going to yield a live birth. And a surplus embryo that's frozen is going to yield the same live birth rate when it's transferred in the future. Whether or not it's the next cycle, the first cycle is unsuccessful, or when that individual is older because she's preserved the present fertility. So you transferring more than one does not increase the overall chance of success. Transferring one is increasing the odds you get pregnant and it's mitigating risk. And for a younger individual, it is always better. And it's often dictated by insurance. So typically, it's a little different from insurance to insurance, but typically for individuals under the age of 38 who are attempting their first IVF cycle, your insurance company is not gonna let you transfer more than one. If you transfer more than one, then you'd have to pay for it. And the reason they're doing that is they recognize that the overall success of transferring one and freezing surplus is the same if you transfer two at the same time and you're mitigating the risk of twins. And that is so important. So it's hard for me to compare it to your sister. And the way you worded it, you said she was unsuccessful because they transferred one. No, she just was unsuccessful in that cycle. And the next one they transferred two and it just so happened she succeeded. But overall, the success when you transfer one and freeze the surplus is no different and there's no reason to take risk. But as you get older, sometimes it's required. Does post egg retrieval having metamorphin increase chances of implantation? I'm not sure I understand the nature of that question. If you want to rephrase it, to tell me um, what you're addressing, that'd be great. So here's a great question. Um, PCOS, um, that stands for the polycystic ovarian syndrome, eight to 15% of individuals who have irregular ovulation. It's due, uh, actually I said that wrong, eight to 15% of individuals who have irregular menstruation have the polycystic ovarian syndrome. It impacts that many individuals um, in this country. It's the number one reason for irregular ovulation. So the way the um, question is um, phrased, I know it's probably very individual 
on actual advice, but are there any general dietary changes or exercise that should be attempted for general overall health as well as helping chances of pregnancy? Great question. So there's so many, the classic case of the polycystic ovarian syndrome, where an individual is ovulating irregularly. And the cause of that irregular ovulation classically is due to being perhaps overweight. And part of being overweight is having what we call an impaired glucose tolerance, meaning prediabetes. And that prediabetes is associated with the pancreas producing lots of insulin, trying to lower the blood sugar. So this kind of vicious cycle where weight, insulin levels, blood sugar, are all feeding into this irregular ovulation and contributing to it. And data clearly shows that taking medication, the most common one being metformin, otherwise known as glucophage, which improves the ability of the body to metabolize its blood sugar, number one. Increasing an exercise regimen, it doesn't have to be hardcore, but increasing it three to five times per week, it can be an hour of walking, it doesn't have to be hardcore. And improving diet will help lower the insulin levels, help improve blood sugar metabolism get the ovaries to start ovulating regularly. We work with an individual who literally wrote the book on the dietary management of the polycystic ovarian syndrome. Her name, and I'm kind of proud to know her because she's so good. Her name is Hillary Wright, and she helps so many of our patients improve their ovulation status and therefore their fertility through these ancillary services such as exercise, and diet. Where am I reading these questions? I'm reading them on the chat um, on my Facebook Live. I'm talking to someone who's completely low tech. That's the best way I can answer it. Is fertility or does fertility acupuncture help maximize IVF success and how to manage and reduce stress prior and during the IVF process. I can say that the most common question I get, literally the most common, when individuals or couples come to me and they're going to start their family building treatments, and if they, especially if they've been diagnosed with infertility, I'm always asked, is stress contributing to my infertility? And here's the answer. I don't know. Because I don't have a control group. I don't have a group that's not stressed about it. It's amazing to me how common the question is. And it makes sense. It makes sense that, you know what? You're trying to build a family. You're unsuccessful. It starts controlling your life and filling it with anxiety. So I would make the argument that stress is not a good thing, obviously. But I can't quantify to what degree it plays a role. There is data and research to suggest that techniques that reduce stress might not improve fertility, but they improve the success of fertility or infertility treatments. Things like acupuncture. So for instance, at Boston IVF, we offer ac acupuncture pre and post embryo transfer, such as cognitive behavioral therapy, such as meeting with groups that are going through the same journey that you are, a difficult one, a stressful one, um, to build their families and how they have an exchange of ideas and techniques that help them. So the reason we provide those ancillary services is because they can only help. They can't hurt. And certainly is, there is data on the acupuncture that it can help. I just wish I could quantify it better, and I cannot. And that's because I don't have the control group without the stress. How much taking different supplements such as Akai, L-arginine, CoQ10, probiotic, et cetera, 
will increase the chance of successful IVF. And not, that's probably the second most common question I get. So, you know, there's Eastern medicine and there's Western medicine. And when you come to a center that says IVF, it's pretty Western derived, but we do everything we can to look at what an individual can do to improve their chances of success. And what we have found is you can hurt it. There's no perfect diet, there's no perfect pill, but certainly you can imagine the things that hurt it, the most number, number the most deleterious um, thing you could do would be to smoke cigarettes. Smoking is really bad. Secondhand smoke is really bad. Drinking alcohol is fine, just not in excess. So I'm not really telling you anything different than your primary care physician would have told you. Don't drink in excess, don't smoke cigarettes. Those kinds of things are bad. Coffee's okay, done in moderation. So in terms of supplements, the one that appears to make sense and has some decent data behind it, meaning some biologic plausibility, is the use of CoQ10. So CoQ10 is probably something I should be taking because it's the quote, anti-aging, unquote, supplement. Why? Because it serves as what we call a substrate, a material that your cells use in their energy warehouses called the mitochondria that help the cells divide better. And so CoQ10 is going to help eggs divide better. And the better eggs can divide, the better will be the eggs that are released at the time of an IVF cycle. When you look at animal data, for instance, older mice, I know that sounds silly, but older mice who are taking CoQ10 have the same IVF outcomes as younger mice and emerging data amongst humans say the same thing. And it has biologic plausibility. It can't hurt. So out of all the ones you've mentioned, for me, CoQ10 is reasonable. The other ones are not going to hurt. I just don't have as good of data on them as I do with the CoQ10. And certainly, if an individual is taking any Chinese supplements, and that is not meant at all derogatory, it's meant as the fact that many of those supplements have blood thinning components that you don't want to be on once you start the injections because you don't want to have complications from bleeding from the surgical procedure. They might be helping. Otherwise, your general nutrition and things like that, but certainly no evidence, or you don't want to complicate um, a surgical procedure, but CoQ10, um, great idea to do. How long do you stay on contraceptives before you do your baseline ultrasound to start a frozen embryo transfer cycle? Um, you can be on them for a minimum of 10 days. You can be on them longer, whether you're doing a natural cycle, one that's timed with ovulation or one that's done with hormones. Since the embryo is already created, um, being on the birth control pill does not have a negative impact. So minimum 10 days, maximum, whatever you want. It really doesn't play a role. What's the difference between a saline sonohistogram and an HSG? Does one show more or less than the other? Great question. Okay. So saline, as you guys know, is sterile salt water. And basically, that's where you're going to flush through the cervix, the saline into the uterus. And that sonohistogram, where you're getting the saline into the uterus, is very sensitive for looking at the uterus. The HSG will look with dye at the uterus, plus it will flush that dye to the fallopian tubes. And the HSG, if it looks normal, that's great, but it's less sensitive than the water that goes into the uterus and the sonohistogram. So in other words, Let's say a woman has or an individual has an HSG 
and the uterine cavity shows some subtle abnormality that may or may not be there. The tubes are looked at and they look great. Well, oftentimes you want to do more sensitive tests on the uterus, the sonar histogram, to pick up what may or may not have been identified on the HSG. And you can combine a saline sonar histogram, the water going into the uterus, quite sensitive for looking for uterine abnormalities, and you put bubbles in the water and you can combine it with watching the water with the bubbles go out the tubes. And you're gonna see if the tubes are patent, meaning open, that they're structured normally. So you can actually do a saline sonar histogram along with a tubal study, which many people do and find less painful and easier to do. That procedure is called a hypose. So the answer to your question is the sonar histogram is best for the uterus. The HSG is great for the tubes, but you can combine the saline sonar histogram with water going through the tubes. Um, Dr. Me, are there any supplements post egg retrieval, um, parentheses, similar to your explanation of CoQ10's help in egg quality, close parentheses, that will help in implantation? Um, your thaw cycle that you're undergoing, uh, this is a fresh cycle, oh, post egg retrieval, sorry, uh, fresh cycle, you're taking the supplements. So without getting too lost in the weeds, when you're doing IVF, you're taking medications that are stimulating the eggs. So they're growing in that month. Well, obviously, as you're stimulating them, you don't want them to ovulate. So as you probably know, you're often taking another medication, typically called an antagonist, either cetratide or Ganorelix, that's preventing you from ovulating. Or you might be on something called Lupron, which you take every day. You have to counter, counter the effect of those medications post egg retrieval, because if you're preventing that individual from ovulating, you did that to maximize your egg retrieval, but then you took away the progesterone production necessary to support a pregnancy. So that's why after the egg retrieval, you go on progesterone. That's what you do. That's the supplement that is going to make your uterine lining rich and thick and what we call, quote, fluffy, unquote, to be the receptive bed it needs to be for the embryo. That's the progesterone. Think of that as the supplement. It can be taken vaginally. It can be taken intramuscularly. In a fresh cycle, they have equal efficacy, but I know of no over-the-counter supplement like a CoQ10 that would otherwise improve implantation other than the progesterone. And for some individuals, they might need extra estrogen as well, depending on the thinness of their lining. And we've gone exactly one hour. And I think, I hope I've answered most of the questions. And again, it was a pleasure to um, be in this discussion. Um, this job, I have to be honest with everybody, is incredible honor. I learn much more from my patients than I do, um, than I teach them, because building a family, providing that, providing that environment where a child will be loved and recognizing that a family comes and all types, um, loving individuals, and however those individuals identify and however they're partnered, being part of that journey is nothing but a blessing. So um, on that note, I think I would like to say goodbye and I would love to do this again and um, have a great night. <laughs>